Hi, I'm Stephanie Clapper, and I'm a New York-based independent casting director, and I've had the pleasure of working with Primary Stages for over 20 years. And in addition to casting for Primary Stages, I cast for many um, theaters, both Broadway, off-Broadway, regional theaters, internationally. I do some uh, TV and film. I um, got my start in the theater sort of unintentionally. I had always planned to be a professional flutist and work as a, as a um, soloist with an orchestra and, and chamber groups. And when I went to college, I went to SUNY Purchase, where I took a very quick right turn um, and went, in, or left turn, depending on how you put it, and um, decided to go to film school. And I got into the film conservatory at Purchase, and I, I was there for until my sophomore year, the end of my sophomore year. And then I got recruited to be part of a new program called Drama Studies. And um, in Drama Studies, I got to create my own theatrical directing program. And that led to great um, internships with the public theater and um, the 13th Street Theater and some other places. And um, I got to develop a number of skills along the way, stage management and some production management. And uh, in my senior year of college, my flute teacher's boyfriend was involved in the new musical and I was asked if I could help the um, accompanist be their page turner. And it turned out it was um, the Broadway pre, the pre-Broadway workshop of Nine the Musical and Maury Yeston was my music teacher's boyfriend and subsequent husband. And um, that was life-changing. That was truly the convergence of um, theater and music in my life. And I got to um, ultimately upon graduation work for the producers of Nine the Musical and they also did Cloud Nine, and I did that for several years, and then they went in a different direction, and I went in a different direction, and um, always directing, though. I really, directing was my path, and I felt that was a great way to use my music abilities, my filmic abilities, and, and my love of theater, and um, one day, I ran into Tony McKay, who's a former professor at Carnegie Mellon University, and he lived in my mom and dad's building in the West Village, and he said, hey, with all this experience you have, you may want to check into this casting job at this small off-Broadway theater. I know they're looking for somebody to do some casting. Why don't you check it out? And I met with the artistic director, and I told him my qualifications, and he said, okay, here you go. Here's the script. Give it a try. And it turned out it was a new musical by Galt McDermott, who wrote Hair. And um, the musical was not great, but Galt's work was wonderful. The book writer was different than his usual book writer. And um, the reviews for the show were not what one would have hoped, but the casting got nice reviews. And it turned out one of my professors who had started the drama program, drama studies program at Purchase was a review for the Village Voice and very kindly helped along with other people like Tony McKay and uh, the artistic director of the theater to set me on my path to casting. Um, but at that point, I really thought of casting more as a great way to collect actors as an emerging director. And it wasn't until several years later, I realized um, that all of the things I loved about directing came into place as a casting person. And it's really what I love to do. And here it is many years later and casting is what I, what I do and who I am. My, my career, is being an independent casting director, what's wonderful is that I get to do a variety of different projects. So I, um, I love the fact that I could be doing a project for primary stages one day, and the next day I could be casting um, a, the Bernstein Mass for the Philadelphia Orchestra. And then another day I could be casting kids for Lazy Town with the creative team being in from Iceland. So um, it's, my career is, is never boring, never predictable. And um, honestly, every job feels like the first time I've ever cast because every challenge is a new and different challenge. And it keeps my team and me on my toes because um, the other part of casting I love is the research and the looking into the depths of the project and the creative team to um, find the best solution to what we're doing. Um, I. I guess it changes. I've always felt that in the work I've done, and maybe it's being a product of, of New York City and Manhattan, that um, I've always felt that racial diversity and inclusion has, has been a very natural fit to what I've done. And I think over time, there've been more conversations about it. I think there's always been the conversation, but I think that people overall are being more mindful of it. So it's not just a unique and different Thing anymore it's just as it should be it's 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 the 
it's representing our global world appropriately. Um, so I think the change is that there are more conversations, people are being more mindful, and, and overall I think our community is being more proactive about, about it. And um, I think it's great and, and about time. I think that um, with projects such as Fade and Discord, we were very um, deliberate in our casting. Fade was very clear on, on what the needs were of that script. I think that Discord is a great example of a conversation happening with creative teams about um, what the director wanted to see represented and what was considered literal and what was considered going beyond the page to create a wider world. And I think Kimberly was very clear that with our casting of Jefferson, Tolstoy, and Dickens, she didn't want literal representations of that. It was, it was definitely a world in which she wanted to see different races and backgrounds represented. And I think that that was not initially what was on the page, but through really great conversations was able to be realized and I think was very successful in the realization of it. But I think what's so important is to have those conversations and to be honest about um, what one is trying to accomplish. And, and um, we just need more of that, quite honestly. I think that also in, um, <clears throat> Kate Hamill's uh, version of um, Pride and Prejudice. It was a wonderful, um, also putting one's imagination to use and, and working off um, not literal representations, but once again, representing the, a global world and our audiences and, and uh, the next step in what storytelling should be and the fact that this shouldn't be a unique and different take on what we're doing. It should be what we're all thinking. And sometimes it helps the, if the casting person brings this up or if it's in conversations with the director or the team overall realizes it. But I think that having conversations is how we're going to accomplish what we need to do next and continue also with what we're doing. The search is, is always different because the material has different requirements, but ultimately what I look for are great team players and collaborative spirits. When it's New York, it's certainly, um, I think that there's a level of talent that is expected on stage, whether it be Broadway or off-Broadway. I think in regional theater, there's also a level of talent, of course, that's expected, but there's the added need for it to be somebody who's comfortable going out of town, who will take the time to be committed to being out of town. And um, whether it be in New York or somewhere else, um, the ability, if it's a new piece, to, to have the wherewithal and intelligence and excitement to develop what's needed in a new piece. So much of it depends on the creative teams. I um, love the immediacy of theater and how quickly things happen. I, I just love that so much. But I think a lot in independent films, that happens a lot too. Um, and more so, I, I'm finding that independent film and theater are very, very similar. Uh, budgets are probably the biggest difference. And TV is really its own thing. Um, so I think I, I love most when the creative teams and I can come together and, and um, make something exciting happen. My feelings about our community are, um, I think we're just very special. This is a community that truly is a community, for better or for worse. I think that um, right now there's a lot of um, questions and a lot of honesty that needs to take place. And I think that um, this, what's important about the sense of community is the, is the ability to have difficult discussions and, and not so difficult discussions, but that it's judgment free and that in a time when so much is changing before us that, that we have the ability to communicate and talk. And I think community is about supporting those changes and about working together. And once again, we don't always have to agree, but I think that if we don't have spirited conversations, we can't grow and flourish in the way we need to, to continue doing what we all love to do. Um, in terms of community and where it applies to me, I just feel so fortunate that in all these years I've been doing what I'm doing, I've developed new collaborations and maintained collaborations for many, many years. And I think that that's a very special thing that, um, once again, to our community that I think is, is unique. And um, I think the ability to grow and flourish together and um, to um, do what we love to do is, is really, um, I can't take it for granted because it's, I cherish it every day. Um, I love seeing people that I've met early in their careers, um, really take off and do things that I always felt they could do, but then they're 
seen in, in a whole new light. It just, it just gives me such joy. And I think as a casting person, to be able to both um, launch careers and then also circle back once those careers are launched to, to put people at work in a new way that maybe they haven't done before is something that I, I, I value very much. I've always wanted to work with Bill Irwin. I remember before I even got into um, this business professionally, seeing his show in regard of flight with David Shiner. And I just, I thought the magic that Bill Irwin created was unlike any other. And, and when I've, I've run into him and talked to him now, I, I'm still in awe of him and, and what he's able to create. Um, I love Michael Shannon's work. I think he's extraordinary and so precise in what he does. Um, there are so many playwrights and, and I have to think of, of them because there are just so many that I, I love, but um, under the um, pressure of, of the camera, I'm not necessarily going to be able to name them all, but I, I've always valued my collaborations with Teresa Reback. Um, Michael Wilson as a director um, makes my heart sore and um, Kimberly Senior is so bright and insightful. She's a joy. In terms of um, future people to work with, I, I have to think about that because I have a wish list that, that goes a mile long, but um, it changes and evolves every day. Oh, I just, I, I just feel so fortunate to be part of the Primary Stages family. It is a family and um, I, just, I just love what Primary Stages does and the people who comprise it. And um, it's, it's so wonderful to be part of a company that's intergenerational and, um, and recognizes people and, and their stories. I have a few memorable stories that I'd love to tell. One is specific to primary stages, and believe me, I have many, many wonderful stories about primary stages. But one of my favorites is when we were casting Terrence McNally's play, The Stendhal Syndrome. Terrence was thinking about um, Chris Noth, the guy who played Mr. Big in Sex and the City many years ago. And he was thinking he might be a good fit for the role of the conductor. And uh, Chris Noth's agents were not very cooperative with me and they weren't giving us the information we needed. And I knew at that point, Chris also owned a club in Chelsea and um, my assistants and I would periodically check in with the club to see if he was in town or not. And, um, and we started having a graph so we could tell where he was and, and what was going on. So we would try sort of other ways to get to him. And one Sunday morning, I was coming from the East Village and I was in the car with my husband and my children and it was a early Sunday morning and I looked like I had rolled out of bed and into the car. And all of a sudden we're driving um, up Ninth Avenue, close to University Place. And I said to my husband, stop the car. And he didn't know what I was talking about. And I ran out of the car, jumped out, and I ran down the street because I saw Chris Noth carrying his dry cleaning. And I was gonna do whatever it took to get to him to tell him about Terrence's play. Um, and I stopped and I held up my hands and I said, Mr. Noth, I'm a casting director. I'm not, I'm not stalking you. And I explained about Terrence's play and what was going on. And he, Chris uh, quizzed me about who his agent was and everything. And ultimately we did get the script to him. We had a lovely conversation sort of post script and it just didn't work with his schedule. But um, I love that story because it illustrates um, just the lengths to which I will go through and go to to accomplish what my team wants and and I will stop at nothing to make sure that at least the person gets gets contacted. Um, and so that's my Stendhal syndrome story. Um, another play I worked on which was a number of years ago was called An Oak Tree and um, that was by a playwright named Tim Crouch and that was done at the Perry Street Theater. Actually it was done at the Barrow Street Theater um, and Perry Street Productions produced it. And I absolutely loved working on that because Tim was the constant at every performance. He wrote the play and he wrote it for himself and a different actor at every performance. And um, the idea was that he had missed the immediacy of theater now that he was in a big successful TV show in the UK. And the idea was that the actor who agreed to do the show could not read the script in advance. And um, they could know nothing about the script. They could not see it, really had to come in as a clean slate. And um, basically it was up to me to cast over a hundred actors, a new one for every performance. And um, it could be a male, female. Uh, the age range really went from late twenties until 80. And um, it, was, it was just such a joy of casting to be able to bring different people to Tim. And they couldn't improvise. But, so there was a script, but Tim would give them the script in bits and pieces on the stage as the show went on. And um, he would meet the actor 45 minutes before to sort of 
prep them for what the um, process would be. But um, that was so exciting because it was another example of bringing in lesser known actors and well-established actors, depending on, on the performance, and really creating buzz and excitement and um, a different kind of collaboration. And I just loved it so much. And then um, another project I have to say, career highlight, was working with the Philadelphia Orchestra and Kevin Newberry on, um, we did three Leonard Bernstein concerts together with live performers who were um, from, from the theater world. So it was a great cross pollination. And um, Bernstein's Mass was our first. And then we did um, West Side Story. And then about a year ago, we did Candide. And um, all pieces I've absolutely loved, a great convergence of all of the loves that I have in this business. But seeing performers that I had um, had in other shows before really show their talents and skills in a different light just, just made me so, so happy. And um, Yannick, the conductor, is, is the most kind, generous, brilliant soul I've ever worked with. And, and working with him and Kevin and our music director, Leslie, it was just, it was just really a career highlight. Uh, my process does change in the room. I, I work a lot actually doing classical theater too. It's, it's interesting. That's the, when I was saying earlier about the joys of being an independent casting director. It's amazing to be able to do free Shakespeare in the parks in New York City and cast that one day and then another day do Hudson Valley Shakes and then once again bounce around and, and do a contemporary piece. When I'm doing Shakespeare, it's definitely, well, it depends on the needs of the theater and the aesthetic of the creative team there too. Um, with Hudson Valley Shakes, there's frequently the need, uh, because it's in rep, the need for actors to not only have great text skill and text skill and be able to move um, with great facility from one role to another, but frequently there may be musical needs involved as well. And they may need to be in, into the woods at one performance and um, doing King Lear at the next. Um, with New York Classical, that it's um, the aesthetic of our of the um, artistic directors one of people because he does panoramic casting or panoramic staging actors need to be able to do to be able to sort of travel with the show and not mind the interaction of audience members so they have to not only be able to do their text work very well but it's also much larger than life because um, they have so many other things they need to do in terms of their traveling the fact that the audience could start it. 200 people and be well over 700 people by the end of the show. Um, and the, the challenges with something like Hudson Valley Shakes are that they're under, the actors are under a tent with the audience, but the great outdoors is exposed and there could be a rainstorm and they're still continuing in the rainstorm. Uh, in a place like Utah Shakes, there are many, there could be three different stages there and rep there too. And um, because it's in the beautiful mountains of Utah, it's, it's, um, once again, very different needs going on there, both skill-wise, but also the ability, if they're not working for a few days, to not mind camping in the Red, red Rock Mountains. So, um, so these are all things that, that I think about when we're casting and what special skills are too. What's nice about what I do is very rarely is it boring because I think that I'm in awe of the talent that comes into the room. And it's what I love so much about my job is being able to celebrate the varied talents of, of the actors I see. Um, what I love is the fact that actors will share of themselves and their talents when they come in. That um, there's, I love when they're well prepared. I love their sense of fearlessness to be able to share what work they've done. I love they're um, being wisely inquisitive, and by wisely inquisitive, I mean it's not a rehearsal when they when the actor comes into the room. But um, if if there is a question, or if there is an exploration, or if there is a new color they they think is appropriate to try in the audition, I I, I really enjoy seeing that. Um, for me, I feel that the audition room is is my party. I've set it up for my clients and the actors coming in and it, I experience great excitement in connecting people and putting people together and the discovery of that. And the, the outcome being one of it seeming like the most natural thing that everybody came together and found each other. Um, I like to say I have Clapper Repertory Company which continues to grow and flourish all the time. Um, I love actors who I can depend on to do the preparation needed. I love the, the spark of joy and excitement. Um, I, um, I think that 
they're bringing their skills up to the table in a way that's dependable and um, surprising in a positive way, something I absolutely love and look forward to seeing. And with the relationships I have with actors, I think the fact that they're kind, generous, bright um, people who have a palette of abilities that, that continues to always um, surprise me. I think being new to the business is, um, it's always really hard because there's this sense of urgency that one wants to get seen right away, one wants to get a job right away, one wants so much right away, and one is comparing themselves to other members of their community who are also emerging talents who are arriving on the scene. I think there's so many things I, I wanna say. I wanna say to be mindful that your pace is your pace. Don't compare yourself to anybody else. I really want you to take care of your creative well-being and your mental well-being and your health, overall health. And I think that always learning new skills and, and always being aware, like, um, I think it's really important to read so much and, and know so much about scripts and actors and life and, and not just be so buried in our, in our bubble of, of theater and creativity, but um, expand your knowledge because so often that comes back around into your work. In terms of things to do, I think the more proactive you are in terms of starting your own groups and, and doing play readings and screenplay readings or maybe developing your own work, I think it's always about being proactive and not waiting for somebody else to invite you to the party, but um, finding ways to connect with people like you and build your circle out is, is extremely helpful. I, I love the ESPA classes because I feel that the teachers are people who are actually in the real world doing it so they have real world experience to share. And, and I really appreciate that and wish I could sit in on, on every class because I learned so much. Um, I think that now in the time of COVID where our world has been reframed, learning how to self-tape is really important and um, learning how to talk to people on, on Zoom or Skype, because I think more auditions for the, for the long term are going to be this way. And it's, it's something that isn't naturally comfortable for many of us, and I'm learning, and I, I would suggest that everybody sort of take their time to learn how to do it in a way that works for them and that's successful. I do have tips for creating the best self-tape. I think if one is taping specifically for an audition they've been invited to do, pay very close attention to the directions because in most cases, one will be given directions on how to self-tape. So one casting person, or one project may want the actor to do a, a slate at the beginning, introducing themselves. Another person may say, I hate slates, don't do a slate, don't do an introduction, I just want to see the work. Um, one person, most of the time people will want very much what my framing is going from like chest to head. Um, Sometimes people may want you to pan up or pan down to give them a perspective of your height. Um, one of the constants is not to look right at the camera when you're talking, but look more off-center to the left or to the right. Um, if you're doing an audition where there are many characters, I do think keep it simple and, and let your tone of voice differentiate the, the characters that you're working with. Um, givens, you want to work on your lighting and make sure you have the best lighting available. Um, the ring light is a wonderful invention and takes some getting used to, and there are different sizes, and there are even some kits that are great because then you could get a neutral background, so you're not doing an active background like mine, but you have something more neutral. Um, some people like white backgrounds, some people like blue backgrounds. Recently, I said somebody had a green background. I think the most important thing is keep it neutral and keep it simple, and let us focus on you. Um, for theatrical auditions, I think keep it theatrical, but, but keep your um, movement a little more limited, but, but do keep yourself animated. Uh, in terms of sides, you want them to be off camera. And if you can be familiar enough that you don't need your sides, it just helps you more with your relationship to the camera. And um, if you do slate, I, I personally feel, but once again, this is my experience, different people have different perspectives. I like the slate to be uh, similar to if we were across the table for each other, from each other live. And it's a nice moment for us to bond together. It's just a, a nice sense of me getting who the real person is. And I love uh, knowing who the person is as well as who the actor crafts person is because when I cast, I really want the whole, the whole person. I want the whole package and that's what excites me.
I don't know if I have words of wisdom on the time we're going through right now, but I, I, um, I've been doing a lot of, of thinking about it myself because I, I vacillate between being sad with where we are right now and um, looking to the future and being excited about what the possibilities are. What I'm trying to do is embrace um, the, the chance to explore what skills I haven't been able to develop as a casting person and in my life. I, I don't always have enough time to read books or to do crafting that I want to do. And, and I find that I'm involved in more committees through the Casting Society of America. And I'm trying to be more proactive in reaching out to people. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do in terms of just um, fill the sadness and the fact that my pace tends to be one that's very fast and loves to do many different things. And I've had to, to change it. I feel that my heart is heavy with actors who like us casting people and, and the people who we work with all the time are so used to being creative and doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one connecting live. And I think that we're finding new ways to do that now. And I just encourage you to, to keep talking and keep reaching out and keep inventive. And I don't think it's a race. I think sometimes people are, are really trying to um, fill the gap by, by running in place so much. And I think sometimes you just have to let, let it settle and, um, and see what those new answers are. Um, I think that there's so much we just don't know. And I, I think that it's really difficult to live in a world where right now we just don't know. And I think that out of that, our answers will come. And we have to be open to that and work together to find that. Um, I think that people use meditation as sort of an easy toss off, toss off and say, oh, you should really meditate. And I think that that's really great for many people. And I, I, I um, have been enjoying reconnecting to that. But I also think um, just just taking walks is, is has always been sort of taken for granted. And I think the fact that we could get out and do that now is something that I I encourage. I just think that um, as in all aspects of what we've been talking about, I just think keeping the dialogue open and um, positive is where we really need to be and to um, support each other. And, and um, I also think that people that we don't always pay attention to the older people in our lives, it's important to be even more mindful of them and the younger people whose lives are, are changed so differently too. I think it's important to, to no matter where you are in your life, be available to mentor and, and, and help in a positive direction. If there's a kid who's, who is, is stuck doing online learning in a way they never did, um, maybe it's offering to do a craft project with them online, a Zoom craft project or something, or read a story, or, or just have a conversation and give their parents a break. But I think it's just, um, it's easy for us to get in our heads a lot and, and think about our own situation right now. And I'm just trying to think and, and encourage others to just think outside of, of your bubble and reach as many people as you can in a positive way. COVID has been a really interesting experience in terms of um, you, one day it's there and everybody's life changes irreparably. I, I'll never forget March 13th was the day that I said goodbye to my, my incredible casting team. And, and I'll probably start crying if I go on much longer about it, but I, I, um, I think we all thought it would be a week or two. I don't think we expected the length of time to be this. I think that we thought our projects would be able to continue. Um, it's really sad. So um, I guess I, I really miss, um, I miss my, my work the way it was. I, um, it was becoming sort of, it's like a sad joke that every day it was a new project being postponed. And the hope is that those projects will get back on track. But um, it was important to really keep perspective on the fact that so many people are affected the way that's, that goes beyond our work. That really, um, I mean, I feel fortunate that so many of us still have our health and, and can think about that we need to get our projects back on track. But um, I think that um, I never, ever expected our world to shift so much. And, um, and I, I try to be hopeful and I, I am fortunate in that I, I communicate still with my clients and we're talking about the future and how to get our projects moving ahead. But I think that 
as with talking to actors about how, how life is going to change. I think life um, in casting, life in production is just going to be very different. And um, it makes me really sad because I miss it so much. But um, I'm looking forward to us all being back together. If the projects come through, which I really hope they do, um, I'm working on a really exciting um, piece. It's a, it's a it's one of Tennessee Williams' last plays called Red Devil Battery Sign, and that'll be um, my client is going to be doing that at Pershing Square, and uh, the date is still to be determined. And then um, Karen Hartman's play, um, which is uh, part of the festival, I think that Primary is going to be doing, but it's an independently produced project uh, called The Lucky Star is, is going to be happening at 59 East 59th, and, and um, I'm so excited. I love that play so much. Um, I'm really looking forward to doing that. And then uh, a project called Grace the Musical, which I was working at, that was supposed to be part of the Humana Festival at the Actors Theater of Louisville. I'm hoping we'll have a future life when we're on the other side of this. And, and um, each of the plays is so different and the musical is so different, but they each uh, celebrate humanity in, in, in very different ways. So I'm excited about all of those. That's just some of the things that we have to look forward to. There's also um, a feature film that, that's coming up soon that as soon as we get the green light to go ahead, we'll be working on that. And that's actually international. So that's gonna be very cool also. So I'm, I, I can't wait for that to happen also. Um, and so those are some of the things. In terms of trends, boy, if I had a nickel for every Zoom reading I was part of, um, I, I would be very excited about that. But um, it's been really, really exciting to see um, how we're all learning to master this new form and, um, and readings are taking on a very different um, um, uh, development. So I'm enjoying that. I'm also really getting excited. I've always loved podcasts, but I'm really getting jazzed about fictionalized podcasts and I'm moving into learning more about that and hopefully doing those right now as the live theater is, is paused. And I have always loved um, storytelling through radio and I'm working to get more involved in that too because I just think that that's um, a place that it's sort of like so old, it's new again and the way to use it um, can be so great. So I'm, I'm very excited about, about doing that. Um, and then one of the play reading groups that I've been working with was actually something that was from my college, post-college years, one of my friends created this group that the shooting gallery, the independent film company sort of came out of it. And it just was recreated and we got to do um, several new plays, a play by James Jorsling called Class and then Deb Lawfer, Three Sisters of Weehawken, and, and then um, um, Jonathan Gruber, um, a play of his. And um, it, this particular reading group, ST, has just been so wonderful because it's, it's brought together a convergence of people from my um, life from long ago with my current life. And it's been really fun to um, bring in people into that. So, so I'm really loving that. Um, going back to other upcoming things, I'm, I'm so excited about Mint Theater it has two plays by Elizabeth Barker that were put on hold, Elizabeth Baker, I'm sorry, that were put on hold that we're looking forward to doing hopefully in the new year too. So um, lots of things to look forward to. It's just gonna be really interesting to see what shape these will all take. And in terms of going back to the trends, I think that <clears throat> us all learning how to work together when we're not in the room together is going to be, until we can get in the room together, is gonna to be very interesting. And um, I think we're working very hard to do that. I also think that um, circling back to our earlier conversation about racial equality and, and inclusion, I think that there are going to be more vibrant conversations and more panels and more ways that we could proactively make positive change. And I'm, I'm so excited that um, that uh, something I, I felt so strongly about for my entire career and before is, is happening on a larger scale. And it, I just couldn't be more thrilled about it. And I just look forward to positive, positive change and positive things and more conversations. My favorite thing about the theater that I know will prevail is that in our nature, we never take no for an answer. It's who we are and, and no never means no. No just means we uh, come up with new strategies for how to say yes. So I'm really excited about all the yeses and all the possibilities that we're gonna create to um, just rethink what we're doing and make it that much better. And, and um, I think we're all looking at this as an opportunity to recalibrate.